So good morning, Rebecca. Good afternoon from everybody here from the other side of the sea. Welcome for this another, in this case, web lucia that we, we organize at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía here in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Rebecca Levy from the University of Arizona in USA. She will talk about feeding and feedback, how to make a Starbust and what that means for the host galaxy. Uh, Dr. Levy will be properly introduced by Isabel Marquez. So Isabel, please. Thank you, Rene. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for coming to this uh, Weblockia, um, uh, Weblockium today. And especially, we are grateful to the speaker, uh, Dr. Rebecca Levy, who has uh, accepted our invitation to be here with us. It's a pleasure for us and um, and an honor and uh, and are, we are looking forward uh, having the news uh, she will talk about uh, today. Uh, Rebecca Levy joined the Stuart Observatory in October 2021 as a NSF uh, fellow. She received her MS and a PhD in astronomy at the University of Maryland in the United States. She is author of more than 40 publications in peer-reviewed uh, journals with more than 900 citations. She has received the Andrew S. Wilson Prize for Excellence in Research, the Philip M. Hofer Outstanding Teaching Award, and also a Prize for Excellence in Mentoring. Her research focuses on using multi-wavelength tracers of gas in galaxies to probe the effects of stellar feedback. At Stuart, she focuses on two prototypical uh, starburst galaxies, in fact, NGC, uh, 253 and uh, M82, both of which harbor a population of super star clusters at their centers and are launching massive multi-phase outflows. She is studying the gas and dust uh, in the clusters and outflows using a combination of ALMA, SOFIA, and uh, James Webb Space Telescope data and other spectroscopic data. She is also interested in kinematic measurements of extraplanar diffuse ionized gas in nearby galaxies particularly in the Edge Khalifa survey, the Khalifa survey being one of those surveys that we know very well in this institute at the IAA. Uh, today, she will speak uh, about uh, feeding and feedback and how to make a service and uh, what that means for the host galaxy, as Rene said. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Dr. Levy, for having accepted our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you again for having me. It's, I'm really excited to be able to give this remote talk at your institution. Um, so as Isabel said, today I'm going to talk about a story of feeding and feedback, how to make a starburst and what that means for the host galaxy. And this talk will span a variety of spatial scales from the entire galaxy, um, zooming all the way down to the very centers of galaxies in this region, in this purple box that's blinking in and out. Um, before I begin, I would be remiss if I did not thank my many collaborators who have helped me with this, with the projects that I will be talking about today. Um, and I'm happy to present um, some new JWST data during this talk um, from our very large team that's working on those observations. So before I dive into some of what I've been working on, um, I want to give a brief overview of what a starburst is and what I mean when I say that. Um, so if you look at the population of galaxies in the universe in terms of their stellar mass on the x-axis and their star formation rate on the y-axis, um, the population of galaxies are shown in the contours and the dots in this um, figure. And if you look at these star forming galaxies, those galaxies that are actively forming stars, they form sort of a sequence in this diagram highlighted here in blue. And we call that the star forming main sequence or the SFMS. Um, and the starbursts, you'll notice, there are these galaxies that lie above this relation. And these are the starburst galaxies. And that means that for a given stellar mass, they're forming more stars than their counterparts, um, again, at the same stellar mass. So they have overactive star formation from what you would expect from the bulk of the population. These starbursting galaxies are characterized by high molecular gas fractions. So here shown in color, um, bluer colors have a higher fraction of molecular hydrogen, the fuel for star formation, compared to their stellar masses. 
They're also calculate or characterized by short gas depletion times. So here, red or colors mean those galaxies um, have more molecular gas compared to their star formation rate. Um, and so both of these things together mean that these galaxies have a lot of molecular gas and they are burning through it very quickly and converting that gas into stars. Another way to say that is that these galaxies have very high star formation efficiency. Um, so on this plot, we're looking at um, the surface density of all of the gas compared to the star formation rate. And the starbursts here in the yellow triangles have star formation efficiencies above the bulk population and sometimes approaching 100%. So in total, these galaxies are, again, very, they have a lot of gas in them and they are converting that to stars much more efficiently than the bulk population. So what do these galaxies actually look like? Um, here's a galaxy or a gallery of some starburst galaxies in the local universe. And you can see they span a range of morphologies, some being mergers, some being dwarf galaxies, and some being sort of normal-ish looking disk galaxies. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to sort of talk about um, a bunch of stages in the star formation and starburst process. So first, how is a starburst fueled? How do you um, make a starburst? How do you get the material down to the centers of these galaxies in general? Um, how are the stars forming? Is it the same as stars are forming in normal galaxies or is it somewhat different? And then what are the properties of the massive star clusters that result from this process? And finally, I'll end on how this burst affects the galaxy as a whole, um, because it's not just um, you know, localized to the center. These star bursts really do have far reaching repercussions for the evolution of these galaxies. So to sort of walk us through this, I'm going to use two prototypical examples of this to sort of illustrate these processes. Um, and these are the galaxies M82 and NGC 253. And I'll introduce these galaxies as we go along. So first to answer, to talk about the first part of this, how is a starburst triggered? Um, so there are three ways that you can sort of um, do this. And the, the central idea here is that to trigger a burst of star formation, you need to get a lot of gas in a small location and compress it. Um, and that compression is what leads to the formation of stars. And if you do this with a lot of gas and very efficiently, then you can have a starburst. So one way that's very efficient at compressing gas is a galaxy merger. Um, when these galaxies are merging, the gas in them um, compresses due to the, the gravity of the merger. Um, and that can trigger a starburst. And so you can see in these various stages of merging in these examples, the regions that are blue are regions of active and intense star formation. It turns out you don't actually have to go so far as to merge the galaxies. The more mild version of this, a tidal interaction, is sufficient to compress the gas enough to um, lead to this starburst. And in fact, this is the scenario in one of the galaxies that I will be talking about. Um, this image is actually the M82 system seen in atomic hydrogen. So here you're looking at the uh, coldish gas in the system, and you can see that clearly these three galaxies, M81 being the primary component, um, M82 up here and a smaller dwarf galaxy down here, clearly they are interacting with one another, but they're not quite merging. And in fact, if you were to look at an optical view of this system, you wouldn't necessarily know that these galaxies were interacting in any way. It really is the gas information that tells us that something special is happening here. Um, so this is a zoom in, an optical image of M82, one of the galaxies I'll be talking about today. Um, it's a nearby galaxy at a distance of 3.6 megaparsecs. Um, it's a barred disk galaxy. Um, it's edge on, so you wouldn't necessarily um, see visually that there's a bar, but we know kinematically that there is one in the center of this galaxy. Um, it's almost a dwarf galaxy. Um, I think sometimes people forget how small M82 is. Um, it's sort of on the cusp. It sort of depends on who you ask, whether it falls into the dwarf regime or whether it's just a little bit too big. Um, as I showed previously, it's interacting with the M81 system. It does not have an active galactic nucleus. And the central roughly kiloparsec of this galaxy is undergoing a starburst um, and is launching this multi-phase superwind shown here in red. So all of this red material 
is outflowing from the center of the galaxy and is purely driven by the starburst. Again, there's no active black hole here. So there's one other way that you can trigger a starburst that's a secular process, meaning you don't need another galaxy to do it. And that's with a bar. A galactic bar is very efficient at funneling gas down towards the center where it can compress and trigger a starburst. And this is the scenario for the other galaxy I'll talk about today, NGC 253. So NGC 253 is about the same distance away from us as M82 at three and a half megaparsecs. It's a barred spiral galaxy. Um, so the image that just faded in is now a near infrared image of this galaxy, where it's a little bit easier to see the bar in the center in this direction. It's about the same mass as the Milky Way galaxy, which makes it an interesting analog to compare to. Um, this galaxy is not merging or interacting in any meaningful way. It also does not have an active galactic nucleus. And in this case, the central few hundred parsecs, shown here in the pink circle, is undergoing a starburst and launching a superwind. So I want to talk a little bit more about how bars drive gas to the centers of galaxies. Um, so here's another view in the near infrared again of the bar of, MA, or of NGC 253. Um, so you can see the spiral arms coming in here and here, and then the bar in this direction where the bar ends are very bright and the nucleus is very bright. So I like to think about bars as gas highways, um, the same way that a highway system is very efficient at taking people from outside of the city and bringing them into the city. Bars are very efficient at bringing gas and material from larger radii in a galaxy down to the very center. So in a barred potential, there are two families of orbits that are associated with the bar. The first ones are called the X1 orbits, which I've illustrated here in orange. Um, there are families of orbits that lie in between these two lines, these curves that I'm showing, but for clarity, I'm just showing the outermost and innermost orbits in that family. Um, the X1 orbits are located parallel to the bar, and it's these orbits that help bring gas from you know, larger radii closer down to the centers of the galaxy. Now there's a second family of orbits at smaller um, galactocentric radii. These are located perpendicular to the bar and they are called the X2 orbits. And it's these X2 orbits that bring gas down to the very centers of galaxies. Now, similarly, if you've ever been going into a city center with a lot of people um, also going there, perhaps for an event or something, you know that when the highway ends, um, the cars sort of pile up near the city center and you end up in a traffic jam. Well, something similar happens in the centers of galaxies. The, there's lots of material flowing in along the bar. And when it gets down to the center of the galaxy, the gas will pile up along this innermost X2 orbit. And when gas piles up, it collapses efficiently, it becomes compressed, and it results in the formation of massive star clusters very efficiently. And so a prediction from this um, theoretical standpoint is that we should see massive star clusters forming near the innermost X2 orbit in the center of barred galaxies, and in particular in the center of NGC 253. So if we look at the ionized gas emission in the center of NGC 253, this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is looking at the Passion Alpha, which is um, a near-infrared ionized gas tracer. Um, and so we should be looking at ionized gas associated with those massive young star clusters. So in the late 90s and early 2000s, there were four near-infrared star clusters identified, <clears throat> with one of these being deemed a so-called super star cluster. Um, so before I continue on, I want to define precisely what I mean by a super star cluster or an SSC. Super star clusters are massive, compact, young clusters of stars. Um, they have stellar masses in excess of 10 to the 5 solar masses and radii of order of parsec or less. Um, in the background image, I'm showing a dwarf galaxy that's undergoing a starburst. And these two blue blobs that I've highlighted here, those are not individual O-star associations. Those are superstar clusters. To put this sort of mass and radius in a little bit more context, um, 
The average separation between stars in a superstar cluster is only 5,000 AU, which is not a unit that I typically think in as an extragalactic astronomer, um, which turns out to be about a light month. Um, in terms of our separation from the sun, that means that the next nearest star would be in the Oort cloud. This also means that there are more than a thousand O stars in each one of these clusters, and that's just assuming a normal initial mass function. So clearly these superstar clusters are an extreme, highly efficient mode of star formation that in the local universe are only found in these star bursting systems, but are probably a much more common mode of star formation at higher redshifts and at cosmic noon when galaxies were more clumpy and compact to begin with, and there was more molecular gas in the universe. So it's important to study these to understand how star formation may have proceeded um, earlier in the universe as well. Okay, so turning back to the center of NGC 253, um, given the amount of star formation we know that's happening in the center of this galaxy based on other um, indicators, we would expect to see many more star clusters, and in fact, many more superstar clusters than are revealed from this and other HST images. And the reason why we don't see them in the near infrared is because of dust. In fact, one of uh, NGC 253's defining characteristics is that it is exceptionally dusty. Um, the extinction in the near infrared to the center of this galaxy is something like 30 magnitudes. Um, which means the flux is reduced by a factor of a trillion. In the Milky Way, the extinction in the visible is something like 30 magnitudes, but here this is the near infrared extinction. And so this is more than enough dust to obscure an entire population of massive star clusters below it, especially if those star clusters themselves are dusty and still in the process of forming. Um, so before I jump to slightly longer wavelengths, I want to share with you some brand new um, JWST data in the near infrared um, of this galaxy. Um, and so compared to this Hubble image, so this was first done um, using the submillimeter array in Hawaii um, by Sakamoto et al. Um, so this is an image of the thermal dust emission um, in the center of NGC 253. This is at a frequency of 350 gigahertz or a wavelength of 850 microns. Um, and at this frequency, the continuum emission is primarily thermal emission from dust. So in this image, you're seeing the giant molecular cloud-ish scale warm dust emission that's associated um, with that massive ongoing star formation. And in particular, if I blink back um, two slides, you can see that that region that is the brightest um, in the uh, radio image is totally, there's nothing special going on in the ionized image. And again, that's because this is so heavily dust obscured. Um, but again, this isn't actually showing the clusters. This is showing, you know, it's too low a resolution. So we need to push to higher resolution. And we can do that using ALMA. So here's a slightly higher resolution image at the same frequency. Um, and now you start to see these clumps of dust emission emerging. We can push ALMA to even higher resolution. So this is now an image with a resolution of two parsecs. And we see these 14 clumps of dust emission emerge. And these 14 clumps of dust emission have all of the hallmarks of a population of superstar clusters that are still in the process of growing and forming. Um, as I'll talk about in a moment, they're still incredibly gas rich. Um, and have the potential to grow even larger than they already are. Um, I wanna highlight um, some work at a slightly different frequency that's being done by an undergraduate, Keaton Donahue, who I'm helping supervise. Um, this is some brand new ALMA band nine data. Um, so a higher frequency of 690 gigahertz. Um, at this frequency, this um, continuum emission is definitely thermal dust emission. Um, and you can see the clusters are still visible in this image. And what Keaton's working on is now that we have two points on the dust SED, <laughs> excuse me, we can attempt to measure the dust temperature in the clusters themselves, which is not something we've been able to do before. It's something we've had to assume. Um, and so stay tuned for this paper and prep by um, Keaton um, looking at the dust temperature in these clusters with ALMA band nine data. Um, but even at the resolution of this and the previous image that I showed, 
the clusters aren't quite spatially resolved yet. Um, and so in order to spatially resolve the clusters to measure their actual masses and radii the most precisely, we need to push to even higher resolution. And so this is work that I led, um, again, using ALMA. This is back at um, 850 microns, um, looking at the continuum emission. Um, and this image is at a resolution of 28 milli arc seconds or half a parsec. Um, and so here you can clearly see um, that though what used to be sort of 14 clumps of dust emission has broken apart into many more sub clumps um, and we're able to spatially resolve many of these clusters now. So what do we know about these um, proto superstar clusters? Well, there's enough star formation happening in all of these clusters to fully explain all of the star formation in the burst. So the overwhelming majority of the ongoing star formation in the center of NGC 253 is happening in these superstar clusters. These superstar clusters have stellar masses um, ranging from 10 to the four to 10 to the six solar masses and their molecular gas masses are about the same, slightly lower, so that the stellar mass to gas mass ratio in these clusters is one on average, which means that even though these clusters already have a lot of stellar mass in them, they have the potential to grow even larger because of their gas reservoirs. And with this new high resolution data, we're able to accurately measure um, radii of these clusters, and they span a range, but these clusters have radii roughly of order half a parsec. So these are extremely massive, compact um, star clusters. So thinking back to the idea of this bar inflow, and um, we would expect to find all of this massive star formation near the innermost X2 orbit. So now that we see it, where is the innermost X2 orbit compared to this? Well, it's here. This is the approximate location of the innermost X2 orbit um, in NGC 253. Um, this ellipse is not only uncertain because I've drawn it in PowerPoint, but the data that were used to calculate these orbits has a spatial resolution of about the size of the innermost X2 orbit. So this isn't really a quantitative comparison, but you can see qualitatively, the superstar clusters are basically right where we would expect to find them. They agree pretty well with where we think this gas should be piling up from the bar inflow. Um, one other interesting thing about this, um, a sort of a different way to look at it, is we know from simulations um, that barred potentials form circumnuclear rings sort of on their own. Um, this is a snapshot for, of a simulation for the Milky Way. Um, and here you're looking at the time average molecular gas surface density. And you can see that the molecular gas forms this circumnuclear ring with a radius of you know, something like 100 parsecs. It's not just the molecular gas that's concentrated in these rings, it's the star formation as well. Um, and another interesting feature of these rings is that they tend to have constant angular momentum along them. Um, so that's what's shown in this black curve here, where the angular momentum of this ring um, oscillates over time, but again, in a time average sense, it's roughly constant. <clears throat> so this gives us a simple um, model that we can use to compare to our data um, to try to figure out the three-dimensional structure of the superstar clusters. And the way that we're able to do this, as I'll talk about in a couple of slides, is we don't just have continuum information on these clusters. In fact, we detect a bunch of spectral lines towards them. And that allows us to measure the velocities of the clusters themselves very precisely. And again, I'll come back to that in a couple of slides. Um, so shown here in the circles are the superstar clusters color coded by their velocity. And in the background is our best fitting, very simple ring model um, with the same color coding. Um, it's a little bit easier to see that this model agrees with our data if instead of looking at this sort of on sky view, we instead look at a position velocity diagram where the x-axis here is now the offset along the major axis of this ring-like structure and the y-axis and the color scale are now both the velocity. And so here you can see that some sort of ring-like structure is a good description of the structure of these superstar clusters, both based on their morphology and their kinematics. Um, and this is sort of saying the same thing as what I was talking about earlier with the innermost X2 orbit, it's sort of just a different way to look at it um, with this data that we have in hand. 
Now, one interesting comparison is um, that the central molecular zones of the Milky Way at NGC 253 are remarkably similar. Both of these galaxies have bars, but um, the Milky Way, as we know, is not undergoing a starburst. Um, so the central molecular zones of these galaxies, these ring-like structures, have similar sizes, structures, total stellar mass, supermassive black hole mass, and the fact that there's not currently an AGN. Um, you can see that the ring in NGC 253 is slightly bigger, but all things considered, it looks fairly similar to the Milky Way. However, we know the star formation rate of NGC 253 is something like 30 to 40 times that of the Milky Way, and the gas mass in NGC 253 is something like 10 times higher than the gas mass in the Milky Way. So it's an interesting question to think about. Is it just purely the fact that NGC 253 has more gas? Is why it's undergoing a starburst compared to the Milky Way, or is there something else going on? Um, sticking with the Milky Way for a minute, um, I want to do a comparison between some massive star forming regions in the Milky Way and the proto superstar clusters in NGC 253. So on the left here, I'm showing a submillimeter image of SAG B2 in the Milky Way. This is taken um, from the CM Zoom survey. And at the same physical scale, I'm showing superstar cluster 14 in NGC 253. SSC 14 is the largest superstar cluster in NGC 253. It's also the most extreme. Um, and so you can see that, you know, sort of qualitatively, they look kind of similar. Um, the resolutions of these images are not so different. Um, but if you look in detail, um, these clusters are actually quite different. So cluster 14 over here is at least 10 times younger than SAG B2 and already has 10 times the stellar mass of SAG B2. A more fair comparison with SAG B2 is actually this other superstar cluster in NGC 253, cluster 2. These two clusters have the same stellar mass. But as you can see, cluster two is much more compact than SAG B2. And again, it's younger than SAG B2 already. If we look sort of at the other end of this, what will these star clusters become once they age and disperse their gas a little bit? We can compare them to the arches and the quintuplet clusters in the Milky Way. Again, all of these images are on the same physical scale. Um, so, the takeaway point here is that the clusters in NGC 253 are younger and more massive than arches and quintuplet. And so when these clusters in 253 clear their gas, they will be more extreme star clusters than arches and quintuplet. OK, so I mentioned a little while ago that um, we don't just have this continuum data from ALMA. Um, ALMA has eight gigahertz of bandwidth over which we can detect many spectral lines towards these clusters. And so I want to focus for a second on cluster 14 again, which is the most massive, most extreme cluster in the center of NGC 253. And if we look at the full spectrum of this cluster from ALMA, this is what we see. Um, so there are two things that I want to particularly point out about this image or the spectrum. The first is what I've highlighted in yellow. Those are all other spectral lines that we've detected. That's not noise. Um, those are all line candidates. And so these clusters are extremely chemically rich, um, similar to the hot cores in the Milky Way. Um, the other thing that's probably a bit more obvious is what I've highlighted in purple. These are all tracers of very dense molecular gas, and they show really interesting line profile shapes. These dense gas tracers show redshifted emission and blue shifted absorption. And this line profile shape is called a P Cygni profile, and it's indicative of an outflow. So when we look towards all of the clusters in the center of NGC 253, we find these P Cygni line shapes towards three of them. So in the insets here, I'm just showing the CS7 to 6 line, where the x-axis is now velocity, so I apologize it's reversed from the previous image. Um, but we see these P Cygni line shapes towards cluster 14. We also see them towards cluster 5. Um, which if someone wants to ask me why it's really interesting that we see an outflow from cluster five, that can be a planted question at the end. Um, and we also see it from cluster four as well. With these line profiles, we're able to derive properties of the outflows from these clusters. Um, so for example, from fitting this line profile shape, we're able to derive things 
um, like the optical depth of the outflowing gas and hence the mass of the outflowing gas. Um, the amount of molecular gas in the outflow is uncertain by about an order of magnitude due to uncertainties in the abundance converting from something like CS to molecular hydrogen, but it's something like 10 to the five solar masses of molecular gas is outflowing from this cluster. And that's a truly remarkable number when you compare it to the total molecular gas associated with this cluster on slightly larger scales, which is you know, only a little bit above that. So the vast majority of the molecular gas in this cluster is currently swept up in some sort of outflow phase. Um, finally, I won't have time to talk about this in detail, um, but we, I was able to write a very simple modeling code to try to constrain the geometry of the outflows from these clusters. Um, so is it you know, sort of a spherical expanding bubble or is it something biconical? And from this, we're able to say that the outflows from these clusters, all three of them, um, are spherical or at least have very wide opening angles. So these um, outflows are more like expanding bubbles rather than bipolar um, biconical outflows. So what is powering these massive outflows? Um, so to do this, we compared the uh, superstar cluster outflow properties that we derived, such as the outflow velocity, the outflowing mass, and the momentum carried in the outflow to numerical simulations and analytic models. And the game that we have to play here is basically to rule out mechanisms. Um, because most of the simulations and models we're comparing to don't are not designed to reach the density of something like a superstar cluster, and they don't model the dense molecular gas because that's really hard to do. Um, we sort of have to you know, extrapolate those models. Um, and so the game we play is to rule things out rather than confirming them um, directly. So the possible mechanisms that we consider to potentially be producing these outflows are supernovae, um, photoionization, ultraviolet radiation pressure, so this is where the massive stars in the clusters emit ultraviolet photons, and it's those ultraviolet photons that um, carry the radiation pressure. Um, we also consider dust reprocessed radiation pressure. This is where the massive stars in those clusters emit UV photons, but those UV photons are quickly absorbed by dust in the clusters, and then the dust re-radiates that um, emission in the infrared, and it's that re-radiated infrared emission that provides the radiation pressure. And finally, we considered stellar winds for massive stars. And skipping over a whole bunch of details, which I'm happy to talk about if people have questions, we're able to rule out the first three mechanisms pretty quickly. Um, and so that leaves us with dust reprocessed radiation pressure and stellar winds as our most promising candidates for what is powering these outflows. Um, but I'll note that no single mechanism can explain all three outflows. Um, and so we really need next generation simulations that will get to the densities of something like a superstar cluster and looking at potentially the molecular gas. Um, and so, for example, one of these simulation suites is the Starforge um, simulation suite. <clears throat> okay, so I've been talking about NGC 253 a lot so far. So before I move on, I want to give a quick recap of what we've learned from it as a case study. So we know that the starburst in the center of this galaxy is fueled by gas inflowing along the bar. As a result of this bar inflow, we find young massive star clusters and dense molecular gas in a ring that's consistent with the location of the innermost X2 orbits. These proto superstar clusters are young, very gas rich and still forming and much more massive than other star clusters in more normally star forming environments. And three of these superstar clusters have outflows of dense molecular gas. Um, and this may uh, be reflective of some gas clearing phase in the cluster um, evolutionary sequence. Although I'll note that this may not be the be all end all re accretion of that material onto these clusters is um, possible and not well understood. Okay, so I wanna switch to our other galaxy for, uh, for I think the rest of the talk. Um, so what about M82? Um, what do its star clusters look like? Um, compared to NGC 253, the starburst in the center of M82 is slightly older. Um, and this galaxy has slightly less dust um, than NGC 253. So if we look to the center um, of this galaxy with HST, 
Um, this is sort of the star cluster population that you see. So all of these bright white dots are massive star clusters that are, again, slightly older than what we expect to see in NGC 253. <clears throat> um, and so if you're watching this in the future, um, I'm really sorry you won't get to see the next couple of slides, but stay tuned for the papers. But since you are, you are all here in person right now, um, I'm really excited that I get to share some more brand new JWST data with you, um, this time looking at NearCam data in the center of M82. So sort of the final piece of this is what do these star clusters do to the galaxy as a whole? Um, and one of the most obvious ones, especially in M82, is this massive outflow. Um, clearly, this outflow will have some effect on the galaxy's evolution going forwards. So how are the star clusters related to these super winds? Um, NGC 253 also has a super wind. It's not quite as impressive looking, um, but it you know, is also visible as well across the electromagnetic spectrum. So when you have these young star clusters, um, right now we showed that they're too young to have supernova go off in them, but eventually the stars in those clusters will age and the most massive stars will blow up as a supernova. And so just sort of a back of the envelope calculation, each supernova injects something like 10 to the 49 ergs of energy per solar massive star formed. And if we take the star formation rate of NGC 253, which is something like two solar masses per year, and we say that it's doing that for the last 3 million years, the you know, average lifespan of an O star, um, this is, um, implies that there's something like five times 10 to the 55 ergs of energy injected from this starburst. And what's more is it's not just that there's that much energy and momentum injected, it's that these star clusters are in a ring, remember, and that's uh, taking up a very small region of space that's you know, something like only like 200 parsecs across. And the stars in all of these clusters are roughly the same age, and so when those um, stars blow up, they will all blow up at a roughly the same time and in a very small region of space. And it's this concentrated in space and time injection of energy and momentum that results in these super winds that we see. And so on the right here is another um, image of M82 showing this beautiful multicolor, multi-phase look at the outflow. And on the left is a schematic from a, a suite of simulations by Wynn and Thompson, where they numerically showed that a ring of star formation like we see in these galaxies can in fact produce these multi-phase um, massive outflows that we observe. So just to um, reiterate, these super winds that we see as a result of the star formation are multi-phase. Um, so in this image in particular, the blue colors are showing the very hot million Kelvin X-ray emitting gas. The orange colors are showing the slightly cooler ionized hydrogen. And the red colors are showing the cool gas and dust at temperatures of something like 100 Kelvin. Um, there's also molecular gas outflowing with this. Um, so the contours here are showing the CO um, in the outflow and disk of M82. Um, from some great work by Nico Krieger using Noema and IRAM data. And then the um, green blue colors um, here in the center and then in these sort of circles in the bottom, that's where we've detected ionized carbon um, in the center and outflow of M82. Um, so C plus is an excellent tracer of multi-phase gas. It can be ionized in the molecular, um, atomic and ionized media. Um, and so I used SOFIA data to find um, this multi-phase gas um, in the outflow out to two kiloparsecs from the disk. Um, so that paper has just recently been accepted. So one last um, sort of point that I want to clarify um, is that the current superwinds that we see from these galaxies are not being powered by the young embedded clusters that we saw from ALMA, for example. Um, again, the super winds are primarily powered by supernova. Um, there's some contribution from stellar winds, but primarily supernova driven. And again, those youngest embedded clusters haven't, they're not old enough to have supernova go off. So those current super winds must be powered by an older generation of star clusters. Um, so this is a wonderful schematic from a paper by um, Sergio Martin. Um, 
looking at NGC 253 on the left here is showing sort of the larger scale um, phases of the outflow um, seen in these sort of colored contours. And then zooming in towards the center, showing the landscape of all of the things happening in NGC 253, where the sort of youngest proto superstar clusters that I was showing with Alma data are here in this sort of lime green color. And older um, stellar clusters, either H2 regions or supernova remnants, um, are shown here in purple. And so, again, it's likely that the current phase of the outflow is, you know, was um, powered by, you know, some, some of these purple-like objects when they um, evolved. And when the young embedded clusters that we see with ALMA eventually age, they will reignite the super wind um, that we see. And this process will repeat, um, and the cycle of feeding and feedback will start over once again. So um, in summary, um, I took you through a whirlwind of how to make a starburst and what that means for the host galaxy. I'm um, using two prototypical case studies examples of M82 and NGC253. So first, how is the starburst fueled? Well, we know in the case of NGC253 that it's a bar inflow that's responsible. And in M82, it's a combination of tidal interactions and then a bar inflow that are leading to all of that star formation. How are the stars forming and what are their properties? Well, in both of them, there are lots of young, very massive star clusters. Um, in NGC 253, we know that these very young clusters are in a circumnuclear ring and that some of them have outflows, so we may be seeing them in different evolutionary phases. In M82, the star clusters are a bit older, um, and this JWST data that we have um, has revealed many, many, many more clusters than we previously knew about. How does the starburst affect the galaxy as a whole? Um, both of these galaxies and in general, galaxies undergoing starbursts have multi-phase large-scale superwinds. Um, and a teaser is stay tuned for JWST data. We have that coming at the end of this calendar year for both M82 and NGC 253, looking at the larger scale outflows um, with NearCam and Mary. So stay tuned for that. And with that, I will stop and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Rebecca, for this uh, very nice and very comprehensive uh, talk. So now it's time for questions. So people, just please raise your hands, and I will tell you to open your mic. Don't be shy. Okay, there is one question by Rainer. So yeah, thank you. Wonderful talk, Rebecca. I, I really enjoy this. Um, you know me, I try to connect this to the galactic center, of course. And uh, so I have two questions. Is um, What's the total mass of stars that is from the NGC 253 and M82 or that was used in? And what's the age, the older age in M82 more or less? What's the age in M82 and what is like the total <laughs> mass is born? Yeah, so um, in M82, the ages of the clusters um, we're hoping to pin that down better with our JWST data, but mm -hmm. it's probably something like five million years. That's what that's the age of the most recent starburst in M82 from some older work. Um, but again, our our incoming JWST data will help us pin that down a bit better. Um, okay. I'm not sure what the total mass formed in M82 is, um, but the star formation rate in that galaxy is more like 10 solar masses per year. Um, in NGC 253, it's like two solar masses per year, um, which is like 30 to 40 times that of the center of the okay. Milky Way. I was just, okay. I was just wondering about the, the relation to the nuclear stellar ring slash disk that is there, or whether it's like a percent of the mass of the nuclear stellar disk, or so I guess a million, two million solar masses, something like that. Yeah, I I admit I'm not I'm not sure. Okay, no, um, it's not. It, it my, my guess is it might be higher than one would expect because M82 is sort of this little dwarfy galaxy that has a lot of gas given its um, stellar mass and its size. Amazing. Now for me, it's like really, yeah, it's great. Thanks. Thank you. Isabel has another question. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk, Rebecca. Um, 
I, I was wondering whether it would be possible concerning the timescales that you could have had some kind of nuclear activity of AGN nuclear activity, at least in NGC 253, which is, has been sometimes classed as a liner galaxy. So we've had some hints of having, I mean, faint or low luminosity AGN activity. So uh, do you think that there may be some kind of time delay that could connect a previous AGN activity with the kind of outflows you're seeing now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the question of whether NGC 253 has an AGN or had an AGN in the past is something that has been going on for almost 30 years. <laughs> um, in fact, these blue sources in this image, um, this one in particular was for a long time thought to be the AGN. Um, that's sort of fallen out of favor. It's more likely a supernova remnant now. Um, we don't actually know where the supermassive black hole in the center of NGC 253 is. It's quite elusive. Um, and um, so in that sense, like it's possible that there could be an AGN, but again, with the new like high resolution radio imaging that we have of this galaxy, we don't see anything that, you know, I think if there were even a faint AGN, we would know about it. Um, there's another galaxy that's quite similar to NGC 253, NGC, um, 4945, it's another starburst. That does have a very faint Seifert 2 AGN in it. And that one we are able to see quite clearly with our ALMA data. And we don't see anything like that in 253. Um, so I guess while it's possible that an AGN could be responsible for some of this outflow, we don't see it anymore. And I think even if it were faint, we would. Um, the other thing is that the velocities of the outflow um, of NGC 253 are quite low compared to what you might expect from an AGN-driven outflow. Um, so it looks like the majority of the outflow is powered indeed by star formation feedback. Hmm. Well, with, with respect to the, your last comment, uh, I think that the velocities in, in AGN should be revised in, in terms of knowing that low luminosity AGNs have lower velocities. Sure. So, so that could be yep. a concern, but anyway, thank you. Thank you very yep. much. Then more questions. Uh, I, in the meantime, while people uh, raise their hands, I, I, I can make a question from a naive one from someone very far from the field. So you mentioned uh, in, it was in the slide thirty-eight that uh, you rule out a series of mechanisms to explain the outflows, but you mentioned that no single mechanism can explain uh, all the three outflows. Can you can you elaborate a bit more on, on that, please? Yeah, sure. So um, the way that we think about um, both dust reprocessed radiation pressure and stellar winds is primarily by comparing the momentum that we expect um, from those processes compared to the momentum that we measure in these outflows. Um, and so in something like cluster 14, the most massive one, um, stellar winds don't come close to um, having enough momentum to explain that. And dust reprocessed radiation pressure can barely get there. Um, in something like cluster five, stellar winds do a fine job. Um, so that one's probably dominant. Um, the reason why we have trouble matching this is almost certainly um, because again, the models that we're comparing to aren't designed to do superstar clusters. They're not um, tooled to reach these densities. Um, and again, we're measuring these um, outflows in the very dense molecular gas, and these simulations don't model that. Um, we are hoping to find signatures of these outflows um, at, in other phases. Um, so potentially with our JWST data, we have spectroscopy coming that will let us do that, although the, spectro the spectral resolution is a little bit low. Um, I also have data looking at radio recombination lines um, at very high spatial and spectral resolution in these clusters. Those are sort of radio analogs to things like H-alpha um, that aren't biased by dust. And so we're hoping to see the ionized components of these outflows in those data, but we have not started working on that yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question by Miguel Perez Torres. Um, yeah, can you hear me, Rebecca? Yes, yes, I can. Well, thanks for the talk, very nice. Um, actually, I, I have a similar well, question to, to that uh, post, uh, just uh, posed, by, posed by Francisco, I guess. Um, so the question is, um, I mean, the supernovae are ruled out 
And I think you mentioned 1% efficiency of the energy. I think it was 10 to the 49 X per supernova. And mm -hmm. I refer to some paper. And actually, I, I'm, that's something uh, I've been wondering for a while. Is it really this 1% true or it can be up to 10%? And because of course, things could change depending on, on, on the efficiency of converting the, the energy of a given supernova that goes into into the into the outflowing. And so is this you know written on a stone that is that one percent or is just a value used in that paper by a striker and shetty? Um, yeah. I think it's just I think it's just a value used. Um, that paper okay. was on more you know not <laughs> not okay. star bursting <laughs> systems. So that number could certainly be higher. Okay. Um, okay. The way the way that we rule out supernova for powering these sort of small scale outflows, not the large scale super wind um, is an age argument. Um, we don't have great ages for these superstar clusters in NGC 253, but we know that they're younger than 3 million years, which is sort of the expected time for that. Yeah, um, yeah so for the, again, the small scale outflows from the superstar clusters, that's not supernova driven. The large scale super wind is probably primarily supernova driven and the exact amount of energy and momentum, you know, is up for um, debate, certainly. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Yes, I also noticed that you mentioned that the, the, the Star Wars was too young to have any supernova explosion. So yeah, I guess, but I, my question was more general. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I have yeah. another, another question regarding, so in your first slides, you show this fundamental sequence you know, uh, um, for galaxies, and then above that we have the the starburst. Yeah, but then yeah, I, I was, I was, which is this is very nice. I mean, so it very, it's very clear, clarifying. But I I was wondering when you show the depletion time, it, it looked to me like actually this wasn't really I mean all that clear. I mean, I have yeah, I see it's every, anything in this from ten to the eight to the ten to the ten in the units you have there for the for the starburst. So so. My question is, is this fundamental, you know, plane or anything, you know, so fundamental or maybe, you know, it's not that, that easy to, you know, okay, you, you showed here and yeah, above the line, we have a, a number. But when, when I look into this uh, depletion time, to me, doesn't doesn't really mean that, that much. So again, could you could you just comment on this? I mean, this fundamental plane, maybe something we, we have just come because it, because it was useful for some purpose, but now it's not any more that useful or you still believe in that? Um, yeah, so I agree that the, the trend that you see here in the colors with depletion time is certainly not as strong as the one that you see in the molecular gas. Although again, the sort of palest colors here are all above this relation. So there is, there is some, you know, uh, something going on here. Um, the use of this plane, I think, is a useful metric, um, especially when looking at populations of galaxies. Um, when you're looking at sort of individual systems, there can be a lot of scatter. And the question of the relative role of the amount of molecular gas in a galaxy versus the depletion time, how quickly that gas is used up, um, in sort of going through this life cycle from you know, starburst all the way to quenched galaxies, um, is something that's currently being researched. Um, it seems from the literature that both are important and it's sort of hard to tell which one is more important. Um, what I will say is that what is clear is that these starbursts have high star formation efficiencies and the star formation efficiency, um, one way to define it is the inverse of the depletion time. And so from this perspective, this is again, sort of where you would expect these short gas depletion times to come from is instead reframing it as an efficiency. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for Rebecca? More. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Manny. One more. Uh, Rebecca, so in, in particular in M82, you said that uh, the outflow was driven by an older generation, by, by a starburst before the current one. Is that correct? Um, so that would be the case in both galaxies. In both galaxies. And what's the average age or lifetime of this outflow? That's a great question. Um, I don't have a great answer to that, um, unfortunately. Um, um, they seem, you know, again, this, 
my sort of saying that all of the stars blow up at the same time is very simplistic. And so I think, um, I think these outflows could be longer lived. Um, if you, especially like in the case of NGC 253, we have these massive star clusters that are, you know, going to blow up in, you know, one to three million years. Um, and so that will, you know, provide some reignition to this and okay. there's still gas coming in. Um, and you can, so I think, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So you have basically during, let's say, three million years, you blow up stars, but then the, the outflow will be visible during a much longer time than that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And again, there's still more material coming in. So looking to the future, that that cycle for some amount of time will continue persisting. Um, in M82, it's maybe not quite as long lived um, because that or it's maybe a little harder to say because that um, starburst is was first driven by the tidal interaction with its group members. That tidal interaction is what dynamically set up the bar that fueled the most recent burst. Um, so depending on how that interaction um, progresses, that could change um, how the burst proceeds in the M82 in the future. Any last question for Rebecca? I don't see any. So if not, yes, uh, thanks again, Rebecca, for, for the very nice talk and the very nice uh, discussion. And yeah, that's for the rest of the people. See you next week or for another IEA seminar and colloquium. Okay, I will stop okay. recording. Thank you all.